Okay, so um, the Chumash people uh, were the first people of this region and they've con contributed so much richness and wisdom to the environment, culture and community of Santa Barbara. So at this time, we're just going to take a few seconds to reflect on and honor the Chumash people. Okay, the um, Santa Barbara League was formed in 1938 after the so-called Spanish flu pandemic. And now in our 82nd year and COVID-19 pandemic has tested us in many ways. In our daily lives, our society, our world, we have all been affected in ways we never imagined. So we honor all the essential workers on the front lines who daily risk contracting this contagious disease the janitors, the grocery store workers, drivers, warehouse workers, letter carriers, food delivery people, teachers and transit workers, along with the doctors, nurses and hospital staff caring for patients, they are all heroes. This webinar is being recorded and I know be viewed uh, on our YouTube site by many people. Please use the Q&A uh, box to ask questions of our panelists, not the chat box. Today's talk is timely and honored to welcome all our expert panelists who will be introduced by our moderator and organizers forum, Emily Allen. Emily, I think, is the only young person I know who convinced her mother to join the league as she did. Usually the mothers introduce their daughters to the league Emily is co-chair of our social policy committee and the program director of Homeless and Wet Veterans Impact Initiatives for Northern Santa Barbara County United Way. Prior to that, she worked at the Legal Aid Foundation of Santa Barbara County as the managing attorney of the Homeless Education and Legal Project, where she did legal outreach to people experiencing homelessness. Emily graduated from Loyola Law School in 2004 and was named the Outstanding Woman Law Graduate of Loyola Law College that year. Emily grew up in Santa Barbara. So now please welcome our amazing moderator, Emily Allen. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, this is my first Zoom League of Women Voters Forum. Usually we're together in the library, but it's so nice to have all of you here by Zoom and the folks that will listen um, in the future when we post this. So thank you for joining us. This topic of COVID and both our immediate response and our long-term response are very close to me in the work that I do, working with people who are homeless, um, experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. But I know our whole compute community has been impacted. And so look forward to the discussion today with these speakers who will start out by talking about what their initial response to COVID looked like. And um, then we'll follow up with their thoughts on our long-term recovery and also um, any, any types of policy changes or systems changes that they feel are really necessary to have a, a true, true recovery. So we will start with Supervisor Greg Hart and very happy to have him start us off um, with the, the county's initial response to COVID. Thank you, Supervisor Hart. To talk about something that is on the front of everyone's mind and in our community around the state and the country for that matter. Uh, COVID-19 has been an enormous um, test of our community's resiliency, and uh, I'm really proud of the way that our community has responded. You know, we've asked very difficult things of local residents, of businesses, of really everyone, and people have rallied to that cause. You can see the division and the, the really difficult um, ideological responses to this pandemic 
around the country, and we have largely avoided that here in Santa Barbara County. And I think that's a credit to our community leadership and to um, the, all the residents of our county that we understood this threat and responded aggressively and compassionately for including everyone as best we could. Um, there certainly were things we, we could have done better, and we'll talk about those things and things we need to do better in the future. But I'm really proud of how quickly we reacted to this uh, crisis. If you remember back, we are approaching very quickly the eighth month anniversary of the governor's um, declaration of a state of emergency, which occurred on March 4th. Um, and then very quickly after that, the county um, held its first press conference to talk about COVID-19 and, and try to be transparent with the community as best we could. On March 15th, we had our first COVID-19 uh, positive case. And then um, very quickly after that, the governor issued his statewide stay at home order. And we have been dealing with unprecedented events ever since. You know, we the, the economic effect, the effect on our children in schools, the effect on um, seniors in nursing homes, first responders, grocery workers, all the things that the JS said at the beginning of the introduction have been profound and impacted all of us. I'm sure we all have very personal stories about things, events that are significant family milestones that have had to be different this year as a result of our response to the, the pandemic. Um, all of us know people who have lost their jobs and are financially um, crushed by these events. And um, we are managing uh, the moment. We are not at anywhere near the end of the pandemic, unfortunately. I think we're probably closer to the halfway point than we are to the end. And while things are at this particular moment in our community trending in the right direction, and that is something to be very proud of and, and congratulate ourselves on that success, it appears as though we're very, very close to moving into the, the next tier, to the orange tier, which is a little bit less restrictive, will allow more businesses to open up and, and it looks as though the, the local school districts are moving toward a planned in-person classroom reopening of schools. Um, but that progress is very fragile around the country. That is not the case. Uh, cases are exploding in many states around the country and in other countries that had previously very successfully weathered the first wave of the virus. And so that threat is real. It is, it is imminent and we cannot um, we must engage and remain vigilant and attend to all of the very simple public health practices that have been preached from the county's Department of Public Health by Dr. Anzar, by Dr. Denrenoso, by community leaders at Cottage Hospital, all of the other elected and community leaders, um, and, and stay the course. One of the things that um, I think has been a really significant help in this process of communication, very difficult issues to communicate to the public, have been the press, conference that the press conferences that the county has held. Um, I've tried to use that platform to highlight community organizations and community leaders who are providing direct services to the community, um, food bank, um, domestic violence solutions, um, a whole host of non-governmental ent entities have been uh, guests on the press conferences sharing the story of the work that they're doing, uh, particularly in, ter in terms of trying to serve um, people who are experiencing homelessness, food insecurity, you know, some of this really difficult, um, the, the plight of the undocumented residents of Santa Barbara County and, and their, their particular unique needs that need um, attention. So um, we as a county, I believe, have weathered this storm politically and psychologically uh, better than other places because we have not uh, degenerated into a fight amongst an ideological fight uh, to a much less degree than other community uh, communities around the state. So um, I think our, our challenge is to stay the course and to do bit even better as we move forward. And all of the elements are in place. We have a collaborative community that is working well together. And I'm just very proud of being part of that and working with all of you to serve the residents of Santa Barbara County. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Next, we have council member Megan Harmon um, from the city of Santa Barbara, who can speak to what this has looked like from a city perspective. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Emily. Hi, thank you, everybody. Thank you to Vijaya and to the league. Have to start with that for your amazing work in our community. And, and also really before I jump in, just lift up Supervisor Hart for his calm, steady leadership over the last eight months. It was actually a little shocking to me 
Supervisor Hart, to hear you say eight months, because wow, that is where we are. And so much of the success we've had as a community really is to your credit. So I, I, I do wanna thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I'm sure we all agree, and I think it'll become uh, eminently clear over the course of this panel that all of us representing various agencies and institutions and organizations, we've faced profound and unique challenges in connection with this COVID crisis. And the city of Santa Barbara, of course, um, as an agency is certainly no different. You know, many people are sort of, sort of surprised by this when I say this, because in some ways our city is such a full service city, but we in Santa Barbara don't actually have our own independent public health arm as part of our city. We really rely on the county and our, our partners with them for public health related items. Um, so when COVID hit, we at the city of Santa Barbara found ourselves in a, a sort of unique position actually, in an interesting crossroads where we are at the middle of this informational nexus, where we're getting inputs from our partners at the county, also from state public health. We're reading what everyone is reading from the CDC. We're getting feedback from our constituents. So it was in that context that we as a council were trying to both make reasoned and urgent decisions while also simultaneously identifying the bounds of our authority. What really was our jurisdiction as a city council without our own independent public health arm in this context? What are the limits of our decision-making capacity? Um, and, and how do we navigate that and communicate those limits with our constituents when they rightfully expect and require of us um, decisive action? So that was a very interesting legislative challenge for me. And I think um, maybe Supervisor Hart and I can write a, a poli sci article about it someday. But look, the reality is this is not academic. The, the fear and um, the concern and the confusion and the stress that our neighbors were feeling, it's not academic and it's real. And I'm proud to say though it was certainly a challenge um, the Santa Barbara City Council and our city as an institution more generally, I think very successfully navigated um, that tension between what our role is as a city and how we work within the broader government system of county and state and, and even, even federal mandates. So that's, that's sort of an interesting um, gloss, I think. And you know, we did respond. I'm proud to say that as a city, we were really on the forefront of making decisions that would protect our neighbors um, in conjunction with county public health and with feedback we were getting from the other institutional actors. We moved very quickly um, as compared to other jurisdictions across the state to um, limit indoor dining, for example, to require mask wearing, to institute a temporary eviction protection ordinances, the things that really were um, band-aids, frankly, um, or what tied our community over as we navigated this crisis together. And, and as Supervisor Hart said, um, communication was a challenge. And I think we learned a lot as a council about how to effectively communicate with constituents who are facing um, a situation as we all were um, of just an absolutely unprecedented nature. But I do think that as a council, we did convey first and foremost that we in the city of Santa Barbara believe and trust science. Um, and that's something that I am extremely proud of and I will continue to be proud of. And I also would add, I think my time is running out here, we um, economically took a huge step, one that folks have been talking about for I think quite literally my entire lifetime, if not more, which is to reopen State Street or to open it rather to pedestrians and cyclists. And I think that will be something when we get to the long-term policy changes um, that will really drive the conversation in the city of Santa Barbara for perhaps a, the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Rubai Estes, the Vice President of Programs at the Santa Barbara Foundation. And the Santa Barbara Foundation, of course, as a funder, has a, a real eye on what the nonprofit sector looks like right now. So welcome. 
Thank you. At the Santa Barbara Foundation, we have the privilege of working with nonprofit agencies, many of whom are represented here, government, business, and other funders, and I really am honored to be here with you. As a community foundation, these months have reaffirmed that our strategic plan is even more relevant in this time of crisis. At the request of nonprofit leadership, just at the start of March, uh, we maintained all of our existing programming and then also supplemented with disaster response and recovery efforts. So this meant that we administered responsive grant, grant programs for food, shelter and safety, behavioral health, access to healthcare, alongside grants to partner for partners in nonprofit support and monthly capacity building grant programs. We also continued our investment in food systems, conservation efforts, and caregiving. And additionally, our focus on working families, workforce development, and childcare has deepened in this time of crisis. So we, of course, did revisit all of our strategies, as we all should, making sure that they were relevant and where they needed to be adjusted to respond to this crisis. So by the time March rolled out grant programs and uh, coordinated resources for nonprofits and individuals and businesses rolled out with them. This is alongside the coordinated community efforts that we have the pleasure of participating in. And I think we've unofficially counted about 31 different coordinations around food, shelter, behavioral health, communication, um, primary health care. Um, and we've also curated a lot of that information online. I'll speak a little to our rapid response grant program. Um, in March, Santa Barbara Foundation, United Way of Santa Barbara County, and Hutton Parker began leading a countywide funders collaborative. As of October 13th, there's about 34 funders that are signed on, and they collectively have mobilized $17.4 million for individual support and for nonprofits in Santa Barbara County. So the collaborative really allows us as funders to exchange information, make sure that we're facilitating timely response, but also to maximize the resources in the community, which are finite. Part of that work is the grant program. So it's known as the COVID-19 Joint Response Grant Program, and that's distributed about $2.2 million to 158 nonprofits. We're on our 30th cycle this week, actually. Uh, this excludes CARES Act funding and individual assistance grants, and but it is uh, it should be noted that the requests were from 290 agencies for 6.7 million. So we only about met about a third of that. Grants to individuals, as of September 30th, United Way was able to award 2,362 individual assistance and rental assistance programs, uh, grants through COVID-19 Joint Response and CARES Act. And in total, I believe it's about 2.48 million distributed to our most vulnerable community members. I know these are a lot of numbers and a lot of activity with our partners and we are proud of that, but uh, what I'll do is I'll get into our systems and policy at the second part of the program. I do wanna note that the drone response effort, though we had, were able to support 3,407 households, which represents 11,000 individuals, it still means there's about 483 approved individuals that are on a waiting list this need is still far from met. Lastly, we also work with businesses, and this has been a pleasure working with government and with um, private sector, with, um, I mean, with government and businesses and um, with nonprofits, and we've been able to mobilize about a million dollars that doubles the impact in Santa Maria and Carpinteria from the CARES Act funding. And I can answer some questions that are in detail to all of this. What is really important to us is that and has been challenging that all of these areas are related they're symbiotic we can't drop the ball in any one of those areas and this is also what brings us back to that we have to do this together none of us can do this alone so the need for cross-sector partnership is really important and as are the policies that support them thank you so much thank you Next, we have Lisa Bravo from the executive director from the Family Service Agency, and they've really been at the front line, you know, providing the services to people who are also receiving financial assistance. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Good morning. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, we at Family Service Agency, we serve Lompoc, Santa Maria, 
Guadalupe uh, and the Santa Barbara area. Uh, people know us by a couple names, Family Service Agency, also the Santa Maria Valley Youth and Family Center and the Guadalupe Little House by the Park. Um, Pre-COVID, you know, before all of this started, we provided uh, basic needs assistance to folks uh, that included things like applications for health insurance, unemployment, CalFresh, utility assistance, uh, information and, and linkage uh, to services, as well as case management to help families stabilize. We also provided pre-COVID support to parents like parent education and child development assessments. And then um, mental health counseling is a large part of, of what we do. Now, all of those services uh, have been needed during this crisis. Uh, we, we actually are considered essential workers, so we've been working this entire time. Um, and just to give you a sense of size as I go through this, we have about 230 employees across the uh, county, and we serve about 30,000 people a year, uh, and in-depth assistance to about 13,000 of that 30,000. So when COVID hit uh, in March, we very quickly moved all of our operations from in-person to remote. So phone and uh, video primarily. That meant a lot of uh, purchasing Zoom accounts, laptops, uh, phones, developing a lot of new protocols and um, making sure that people had home office situations that, that worked okay. Uh, we, we also very quickly at our agency opened up our decision making process so that we could be getting input from employees across the county so that we could keep tabs on what the needs were in the communities. What we found is that needs were increasing very rapidly um, and the community response to those needs was also moving at quite a quick pace. So we set up weekly, uh, well, we set up daily briefings with managers and weekly meetings with the entire staff so that we could hear what was happening. Um, this, <clears throat> this new process helped us to be agile. We could deploy staff where needed. Um, and with everyone's input, we were able to make decisions on the spot or gather the information needed so we could make decisions rapidly. And what we found, of course, is that additional services were needed. Um, so we added quite a number of services, primarily through partnerships. We added food supply and distribution in partnership with Food Bank and First Five. Uh, we also uh, worked with United Way and the COVID-19 joint response effort to process the applications for financial assistance that Rubai was talking about. And at the same time, we could assess um, additional needs that families uh, have so that, that we could assist them with the whole continuum of needs that they have instead of only the, the financial assistance. So a, a really wonderful partnership there. We set up uh, phone coaching lines across the county, which have been very um, popular with parents because parenting has been a pretty uh, difficult situation uh, in the midst of virtual schooling, et cetera. We also collaborated with a number of uh, nonprofits across the county to identify isolated seniors uh, and provide assistance to those seniors, things like supplies and food. Uh, we partnered with the public health department to open up a program called Housing for the Harvest, which is um, motel rooms to isolate or quarantine in plus wraparound services. And then we also brought our youth mental health first aid training uh, online so that people, adults who are working with youth or adults who have kids could, could learn how to identify mental health needs uh, and understand how to respond to those. And that's a partnership with the Mental Wellness Center and Youth Well. We also, during this time, worked very closely with funders, the Santa Barbara Foundation, many other private uh, funders, uh, and the public funders to try to gain as much flexibility as we could in the contracts that we have so that we could respond quickly to what the to, to community needs. Um, and I want you to know that has been a really wonderful uh, partnership that we've had with the funders. It has made all the difference for us. And then lastly, what we did is we made sure that we were taking care of our staff. Uh, many of them needed childcare, for example. So we set up childcare at all of our offices. And we've been working very closely with our board of directors to ensure that we're working together in making the best decisions that we can to try to meet community needs. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
Next, we have Frank Rodriguez, policy advocate at the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, also known as CAUSE. And CAUSE has, of course, been on the front lines of advocating around housing issues and um, workers' issues. So Frank, welcome. Thank you, everybody, um, for having me and for having this conversation. Um, again, Frank Rodriguez um, with CAUSE. And um, yeah, at the start of this, I really want to focus in on we're a base building organization, building a base of um, community leaders, youth, young adults, and adults in Santa Maria, Santa Barbara, Oxnard, Ventura, and Santa Paula. Um, so I think our, our initial reaction was really touching base with um, um, the base um, through a survey to really um, see what were, were the issues and us really making sense of kind of the COVID-19 response and um, the, the community response that was needed for that. Um, alongside that, um, um, talking about the, the tenants' rights issues that we've been advocating over the years, um, we released a housing report in 2019, really highlighting the, the growth of the housing crisis, which um, over the last five years, we've really focused in the city of Santa Barbara, where we've definitely seen um, gentrification and a lot of pushing out of communities of color, especially Latino immigrant communities. Um, um, however, in, in talking about these issues as a base, folks in Santa Maria, folks in Ventura, folks in Oxnard were saying this is not just an issue in Santa Barbara, this is an issue affecting us throughout the region. Um, so um, I think through, through this process, um, Glad Edder um, is with us to, to speak next, especially on the DocuFund efforts throughout the region. Um, but I think in terms of tenant rights, um, that fear of folks losing their housing and the the, the the quickly changing state laws, municipal laws, and county laws that are are coming into place to protect tenants um, has been a lot um, um, and a lot to keep up with. Um, and so we we definitely in looking at, at, at beyond recovery and um, how do we respond to what's going on is making sure folks aren't displaced um, in a way that's going to kick folks out of out of our region because of the lack of re, um, um, economic security or or housing security during these times. Um, so I think eviction protections have been a huge um, um, piece for us and, and we're glad for the actions that the county and the um, and the city of Santa Barbara took and knowing that we have to work alongside now what, what the state has passed with um, Assembly Bill 3088, um, allowing for um, deferred payment, but um, the asking of 25% of that rent um, from now until January 31st from tenants. Um, so I, we're, we're glad with that, that there's these plans being put into place, um, but we want to make sure that we continue to investigate those to make sure that, um, especially at our local level, um, and I think a lot of focus has been on the courts um, and as eviction proceedings um, are open to them, how do we make sure that um, we're not um, putting tenants in um, um, difficult situations that they won't be able to, to sorry about that, to be able to return back to um, 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 their home. So um, we know it's a complicated conversation. Um, we know um, um, there's a lot to discuss on that end, but for us, um, um, making sure folks are not displaced during a health pandemic is is vital. Um, and, and especially knowing that, that COVID-19 has been um, I'm hurting dispro disproportionately, especially historically marginalized communities, um, um, has been hurting a lot with, with Latino and, and Black communities um, throughout the region, um, really uplifting that, that call for, for equity and, and making sure that um, um, we're, we're protecting um, those who, who might not have that security um, if they are displaced to, to, to stay here in our community, um, especially our service sector working economy, um, our, um, our farm workers throughout the region. We want to make sure that we have um, sustainable um, tenant rights um, in place to make sure that we're not um, um, seeing a whole different kind of 805 after um, COVID-19. Um, and so on the other hat of, of work that we've been doing, it's with the Immigrant Latinx um, Immigrant Task Force. Um, I'm working with, with Vaughn and the um, Public Health Department um, with the Public Health Director. And I think that's been a great space where I've been able to help with facilitation of allowing folks to engage um, with the health department and, and, and different spaces in order to collaborate, um, especially in getting out the, 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 the message on, on information on COVID-19 um, with farm worker communities um, um, in, in, in our region. Um, so overall, um, I think there's been a lot of 
great collaboration and and more and more kind of real focus on how do we ensure that that we're helping all our communities and how do we work together to do that um, so appreciate to to be here today with you all thank you next we have Edder Guyona Macedo um, executive director with future leaders of America and the 805 undocu fund which is really you know making sure that people who historically have been excluded from relief under different federal funds have access to funding. So welcome, Edder. Hi, everybody, and thank you. Uh, thank you to the, to the League of Women Voters for having me. Um, again, my name is Edder Gaona Macedo. I am the Executive Director for Future Leaders of America and a steering committee member for the 805 Undocu Fund. A um, little bit of history, the 805 Undocu Fund started in 2018 as a response to the Montecito mudslides and the Thomas Fire when we saw that undocumented families were hurting as bad or worse than um, other folks who were displaced or um, were having issues with, with uh, their, their jobs. And so we created the 805 Undocument to provide financial assistance to undocumented families really who were affected um, in, in, in the Montecito area and in West Ventura. Um, as you've all seen and, and heard, you know, undocumented families do not have access to any state or federal um, assistance, financial assistance, including unemployment or um, the CARES Act that, that came out uh, this past uh, March and April. And so we've we've definitely seen uh, the impact of COVID-19 and the impact it's had on undocumented families. It's not just financial, but it's also social, it's racial, and um, it also has mental health, uh, mental health consequences that are gonna take years to fix. When COVID-19 hit, we knew that undocumented families were gonna be some of the worst hit. Not only being undocumented, but being Latino and being uh, families without um, health insurance or access to health insurance. Locally here in Santa Barbara County, we've seen that 60% of all COVID-19 cases have actually been Latino community members. Um, so we've seen the impact. And when we reconvened the 805 Undocu Fund along with our partners, uh, Cause and MyCob, we knew that the uh, COVID-19 was gonna be big. We didn't know how big. Um, we did a soft launch and we put up the, um, the registration link and without any announcement, we, we saw over 1500 people signed up over a weekend. By the end of uh, the one month period that we did have the link open, we had about 7,000 individuals who signed up for financial assistance. We went back to our group and we, uh, we did the math and we, we saw that we needed to raise up to $5 million to provide financial assistance to, to undocumented families. What was different with COVID-19 is that is the social distancing. We couldn't meet individuals. We couldn't uh, be face-to-face. -face. And the way that we were able to get um, complete applications in the past were through uh, clinic workshops. So this time we, we really needed to reinvest in our technology, reinvest in Zoom accounts. I think Lisa mentioned that earlier um, and figure out creative ways to protect identities of undocumented community members. Because even from the onset, we were getting hate mail, uh, hate calls, people telling us that what we were doing was immoral, illegal, and they were gonna go after our list and essentially threatening the lives of 7,000 individuals here in our community. So we got encrypted technology. We were able to uh, beef up our, our security. Um, and since, um, since March, we've been able to raise $5 million, um, all for undocumented families. Um, as of uh, last Friday, we've been able to distribute $2.5 million. Um, we fired six additional staffers to just process applications. Um, and again, all of this is done virtually. We know that some of our community members cannot, uh, don't, do not know the language. I do not know how to read or, uh, or, or even write. So we know that we need to provide that extra assistance to make sure that they get the, the money necessary. The average grant has been $1,200, mimicking the federal stimulus that went out in April. And um, we're gonna continue to, to make sure that undocumented families have what they need. Um, on the future leader side, we've also done a lot of, uh, a lot of groundwork to make sure that uh, Latino students specifically have what they need. Um, in the, 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 the time of COVID. I am sorry, my puppy's a little uh, anxious right now and needs some attention. Uh, and we've, we've looked into different policies to make sure that um, the students have what they need. Uh, we're going, uh, we're canvassing for Proposition 15, Schools and Communities First. Um, 
a, a proposition that if passed will reclaim over $12 billion here locally in the uh, in, in the state of California and in the county of Santa Barbara, over $107 million that can be used for uh, funding, for school funding, but also general funding. We know that Latino students are, are hurting and that they need um, additional support behind a hotspot in their in their homes. We know that they need extra tutoring and we know that they need extra access. So um, over the course of the next uh, two weeks, we're finishing up 10,000 calls um, to registered voters, both in Ventura and Santa Barbara County, um, and also sending out a mass texting, uh, max texting, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get the resources that we need so Latino and undocumented families have what they have. Again, thank you for having me. Um, and I apologize for my puppy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next, we have um, Abe Powell, co-founder co and executive director of the Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade, Brigade, which has shown an amazing ability to bring people together and respond as a community. Welcome, Abe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so the Bucket Brigade was created to prepare for and respond to natural disaster and crisis through uh, volunteer training, coordination, and deployment. Um, and that can seem a little nebulous, but, but it, it, it's very concrete. And our goal is grassroots resilience founded on the idea of community cooperation and collaboration to address community need and to do that in an organized way. Um, so the, our method in a crisis that we demonstrated in, in various times, including in the debris flow of 2018, was to anticipate, understand, and address community needs that emerge from a crisis through cooperative action. Um, so uh, part of uh, the ability to do that comes from knowing your history. Uh, and so, you know, we collect and preserve and share community wisdom of, uh, in regard to resilience and disaster response techniques so that we can kind of help identify what could happen in a community and what eff effective response systems are. Um, and one of the things we know from disaster history is that the um, marginalized communities tend to get hit the hardest and receive the least resources in any crisis. Um, and so how does that apply to COVID? So um, as soon as the shutdown happened and we were still pretty uncertain about how transmission was occurring, um, we knew that there was gonna be a lot of isolation and we did organizing, we organized a, a neighborhood cooperation in a crisis uh, education and webinars. So the goal of that was to get neighbors cooperating to assist the most vulnerable members of their neighborhoods to uh, address need, and in this case, isolation and access to food. So seniors who were afraid of getting sick and couldn't go to the store, uh, we had trainings on how to safely shop for your neighbors. Uh, we assisted uh, in consulting with groups like um, uh, uh, Zoomers to Boomers and other groups to get uh, you know, people connected, people who are isolated connected to food uh, and, and just contact with people, safe contact with people during the lockdown. Um, one of the early things that, that came up that also happened during the pandemic was a need for PPE and a shortage of PPE. So the Spanish flu gave us clues to what to do now. And we knew that, that this was gonna be a problem and it was. So uh, we had a huge supply of, of PPE for volunteer deployment and especially masks, coveralls and, and that kind of thing, latex gloves, hand sanitizer. We donated, donated our, our cash to the food bank and to the cottage hospital. And then we realized that that was still nowhere near what was needed. So we went back to our core operating principle, which is how can we cooperate as a community to meet that need, the need for PPE. And we started a crowdsourcing operation for, uh, to make cloth face coverings and face shields. Um, and over 300 people signed up to help us. Uh, to date, we've made over 38,000 cloth face coverings that we've given away for free to vulnerable communities, including every single prisoner in Santa Barbara County Jail, um, uh, H2A workers from Alco and other places up north, and a lot of other groups. Um, so that was a cooperative action to address urgent community need. Um, we also 
collaborated with other groups to, to help identify need and strategize around meeting that. And part of that was joining the Immigrant Health Task Force uh, and working uh, with them to help see kind of what was happening in the community with uh, our most vulnerable communities and strategizing on how to address that. One of the things that we've seen uh, is, is food insecurity, whether we're talking about the food insecurity we saw um, at the grocery store when people panicked uh, or the food insecurity we see now where the roles of seniors, for example, who need uh, food assistance has gone up 75% this year. So we've seen an urgent increase in, 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 in uh, food aid, need for food aid and food security. And um, what we decided was to start a growing community project to get people growing at home uh, and to build capacity to grow food under duress in a community. And so the Growing Community Project partnered with a number of organizations and we're getting a, a network of home gardeners growing at home, uh, community gardeners growing in community gardeners and sharing that food throughout the community to help increase access to fresh produce in uh, vulnerable populations in Santa Barbara County. And all of this is to serve community resilience building through collaborative and cooperative action at the grassroots level. Thank you very much. Next, we have Kathy King, Director of Outreach and Education at the Community Environmental Council. And I think we've all heard that there have been sometimes some, we believe some positive impacts of COVID potentially on our environment. The Community Environmental Council can speak to that, but are also doing other important work in the community. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this event. And it's an honor to be with all of you on this panel today. Um, when the shutdown began, my immediate personal reaction was, wow, people all over the, our community and the world are coming together for the common good. And this is sort of a basic principle of working on climate change, right? We need everybody to come together for a, this common cause that will save us all. So um, that, that's what struck me at the outset. Um, obviously, it relates to CEC's mission to uh, for a just and equitable transition um, to to renewable energy and to get us out of the climate crisis. Um, but there are a lot of parallels of what we've done as a group that can be transferred to that. It's it's not going to be even as painful, I think. But I think that now people sort of get it. Um, in terms of how rapidly that 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 the general public responded to this, because you know we were we're wearing masks for each other as much as for ourselves, and and um, and just concepts like that. Um, on a practical level, um, when we all started working remotely, our CEO made some great immediate changes that kept our staff on track and connected. We went from twice monthly to weekly staff meetings. Um, and these staff meetings are more than just, you know, report outs on our work. It's also a chance for us to have little breakout sessions and connect with each other um, kind of on a personal level. You know, we're not passing each other in the hallway or having, you know, you know, chats in the kitchen while we're making lunch anymore. So just to give us the space to connect personally, um, you know, it, it informs our work as well. So it keeps us part Keep, keeps us continuing to be a team, even when we're not in the same personal space, physical space anymore. Um, as you probably know, we produced the Santa Barbara Earth Day Festival, and that was one of the first major community events on the calendar right after the shutdown. So we had to pivot very quickly to producing an online event. Um, and we were pleased with the outcome. It was very challenging. Um, we actually had more views on that than we do people in the park in general. Um, and obviously there's no replacement for in-person connections that happen, but it, it did allow us to create an event that provided information and entertainment and also to mark the 50th anniversary of the creation of Earth Day, which was a huge milestone, especially given the local roots of that. Um, and then we set a standard for events going forward, um, which was very gratifying. And we had a lot of other people in the community coming to us and saying, how do we kind of do what you did? Because we had live hosts that made it feel like the whole event was happening um, in front of your eyes, even when a lot of the content was actually pre-recorded. Um, we've since created a more structured online event process, um, and we regularly have greater attendance at these than we did at our 
in-person events. And a lot of that is due to the constraints of, of physical space. So I think that going forward, we will continue to include an online component to events, even when we're back to meeting in person, because you know it's greater access outside the region and also just uh, alleviates that physical space. You know, we're always worried about, oh no, we're sold out and can everybody come? So it's, it's, uh, it creates a, um, it's more, egalitarian to have events that that a lot everyone can attend that wants to. Um, the best example programmatically of what we did in the immediate reaction to COVID was through our food rescue program. They partnered with the um, Santa Barbara Alliance for Community Transfer Transformation and other partners and developed a community food collaborative. They purchased locally sourced food to distribute to low-income families, unsheltered individuals, and also to respond to all of the people who were suddenly unemployed and food insecure. Um, the pandemic accelerated this food rescue work that was already in motion. Um, in 2018 and 2019 combined, the program rescued about 38,000 pounds of food. So far in 2020, the program has rescued over 80,000 pounds of food. And this new visibility has attracted more partners, allowing the network to be built further. We already had big ideas for the future of this network, promoting collaboration, efficiencies, and bringing in different sectors to show how intertwined the goals really are. Reducing waste, protecting the environment, and feeding people all come together in the food rescue program. And the pandemic has helped move these goals forward and highlights the needs that might not otherwise have been realized. Um, we have more examples, but I will stop there and um, share more when we talk about the long-term recovery. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So next we have time for question and answer. And um, you can type into the question and answer questions that you have. I do have some questions, you know, that have been shared um, with me that um, some, some folks would like to see asked, but we'd love to hear from the audience also. So try to make them concise if possible. I have one from Linda Honickman and she um, wants to thank this impressive group. I'm especially appreciative of the efforts of Edder and the Undocu Fund. A few questions to Supervisor Hart and Council Member Harmon. If we do not get more stim stimulus, what will our government um, budgets, will our government budgets be in trouble? Can you speak to how this could impact um, the county and cities financially. And Supervisor Hart, I'll have you go first. Well, I'm, I'm seeing the glass half full. I think there's going to be tremendous change on election day. And I'm hopeful that with that change, there will be um, a more rational and comprehensive response from the federal government. Um, that has been sorely lacking and one of the biggest um, things that stands out during this pandemic. But the answer to um, the question is yes, we will be in very difficult um, catastrophic financial situation without additional assistance from the federal government. I think that I can speak for every local government in the country in that regard, every state government in the country in that regard. You know, we can't shut down the economy as we have had to do to protect uh, public health and not have enormous financial cons con consequences to governments and to individuals. And we need a, a rational, comprehensive federal response to make, make this work. Council Member Harmon. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second that completely. I mean, particularly Santa Barbara um, is in a challenging position as a, a tourist town, um, a town whose economy relies pretty strongly on the tourist trade. You know, this has hit our budget um, in ways that are, are pretty impactful. But I, I do need to acknowledge the work of Supervisor Hart when he was on council of fully funding our reserves. And you know, I, it's not particularly sexy to like champion funding reserves, you know, it doesn't really get people all excited and you're not seeing tons of Facebook posts about it, but here we are um, experiencing the benefits of having a fully funded reserve. I mean, we were really able to um, make up the gap by leaning on that, and that's exactly what it's for. So, you know, I, I have to lift up the work of council members who've come before me and who've prioritized that despite pressures to spend monies in other ways, because we find ourselves in a true fiscal emergency and, and having that um, buffer to be able to continue to provide the level of service to our residents that, that they deserve. So that's a good thing. 
Um, but but yeah, frankly, I mean, we've we've got to get some help from the federal government and particularly cities our size. Um, it's important that we're included in, in whatever stimulus is to come. And I, I just don't think that it's feasible to leave out municipal governments that um, represent 90 to 100,000 people. We, we truly are feeling the pinch. So I'm hopeful as well. Thank you. Another question we received, what does, what does normal look like post pandemic? And, you know, really, I think getting at the question of, um, do we want to go back to normal or should normal look differently? So whoever would like to jump in, um, please do. Well, just real briefly, I would say that this is an opportunity to go back to better, right? Rather than back to normal. I mean, we've seen a dip in fossil fuel usage across the world. I think as you, Emily, sort of pointed out in the introduction to me that um, there's, there's a slight benefit there. You know, people aren't flying and flying takes a lot of fuel and, and creates a lot of emissions, but um, that's gonna come back, right? So how do we fix these systems so that when things come back, they come back better than they were before? Um, I think, uh, you know, in a slightly less positive tone, um, I think the economic fallout from what's happening now is going to be very long-term. Um, and, and an example of that is if you just look at the people who are pending eviction right now and the roles of, of, of pending evictions that have been stayed through various policy, you know, kind of stopgap measures, um, you know, we're experiencing a homelessness crisis in Santa Barbara now, and that should increase dramatically uh, next year. Um, we're experiencing a, a, a food insecurity crisis, um, and we expect the economic fallout of all this long-term unemployment to, to, to dramatically affect that in the years to come. And so, uh, and, and all of this within the context of climate change, where, you know, something unimaginable before happened, uh, 4 million acres have burned already in California this year, and we're experiencing a crisis within a crisis, and I think really getting our heads around how serious the situation is now and, and, and moving forward for vulnerable populations and ultimately for all of us um, in the county is, is gonna be uh, a, a, a really uh, a, an important priority for all the groups like and all the people that are here moving forward. So the next, I just another wanna add. Oh. And Edder, it's directed to you, so you'll get a chance to start out, but the community needs that you see arising um, in you know, in the future. What do you see beginning to emerge as a need? Yeah, uh, I mean, just going back to the previous question, the old normal wasn't working. And so this is definitely an opportunity to build up and really talk about what equity looks like in a new society. It's not fair that undocumented immigrants do not have access to these resources, they become the backbone of our economy, yet we treat undocumented immigrants like second-class citizens. And so it's definitely uh, uh, an opportunity to build up and change the narrative in terms of what's, 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 uh, what's being seen. Definitely a lot more help is needed. Um, undocumented families, some have not worked since March. There's a lot of mental health issues happening right now. Uh, a lot of single moms, we have seen many single mom households that do not have the resources, the time, or the know-how to get their students through, you know, uh, assuming through, 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 uh, through school. And in order for us to make a more just society, we're really gonna have to think about what equity means and what equity means here in Santa Barbara. Just because the city is wealthy or the people are wealthy doesn't mean that everyone is well off. And part of that is making sure that resources are available, including mental health, um, healthcare, um, and that everything has, um, it, it's translated um, because there, even though a lot of this information is still out there, there's still people that aren't getting the information um, and we need to make sure that that gets out there. Thank you. And Lisa, um, also, can you respond to what you're seeing as emerging needs? Uh, actually, I would, I would 
uh, support what Edder just said. The longer this goes on, uh, the more intense the needs are. So, you know, not paying rent one month, not paying rent two months, not paying rent three months, not having food to feed the family, not being able to support their, their schooling, these things just get worse the longer we're, we're in this situation. So that means it takes even more resources to help people dig out of, of these problems. Um, and you add this really important issue of equity. Oh, oh my gosh, um, th things are looking um, tough on this road ahead. Uh, and I would agree with Kathy, let's return to better. That's the idea is that if we can take a look at what's going on, try to reprioritize our resources so we can address these things in the best way possible, maybe we can actually end uh, in a better place in regard to equity. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Thank you. There was a question about how many homeless in Santa Barbara and the greater area. And I, I think I'll jump in with, you know, in the recent point in time count, and it's similarly shown in data, we're now collecting on a very regular basis in our homeless management information system. There were 1,897 people surveyed countywide um, for the city of Santa Barbara, because I think Santa Barbara was also part of the question. In 2020, there were 914 surveyed in the city of Santa Barbara. And the numbers have been fairly flat, but with COVID and um, with potential for eviction, you know, that certainly could increase. And then just to share with folks too, we usually do our point in time count in January and January 2021 would be when we would do it. And we're still waiting to hear more from the federal government exactly what that will look like during the time of COVID, where of course engaging volunteers and doing a big effort like that, um, really for safety reasons, will need to look differently. So more on that as we um, receive more information. One question and um, was also about domestic violence. And um, Rubai, did you have anything you'd like to share there? Yes. As April, we started hearing from agencies who are working in this area about the increase in domestic violence. The challenge is reporting. So a few things that we've heard is a some people, especially with mental stress and loss of employment and hardship, uh, uh, victims are trapped in the homes with these abusers often. So reporting has been a challenge. Also, when an Patients who are already receiving services, they had to move remote behavioral health model, technology gap issue, there's a language and cultural gap issue, and also again, limited devices at home and not being able to find a safe space to have that behavioral health counseling. So agencies were starting to look creatively and find safe spaces that are physically and mentally safe uh, where individuals can go to receive counseling. Um, with children, this is much harder and underreported. Um, from the COVID-19 during response, we've done multiple rounds of funding in the area because of the increase. As far as we know, and maybe somebody else can speak to this more accurately, the reporting is far real, let alone what it was before COVID-19. Yes, the only thing I'll add to the domestic violence is, you know, on a positive note, the domestic violence you know, provider you know, has partnered with other shelter providers and are finding ways, you know, sometimes needing to use motels, but to make sure that survivors are able to you know, leave those situations. So just encourage anyone who is experiencing that or has a friend who is to connect, connect that person with um, domestic violence solutions locally in Santa Barbara County to provide assistance. So a question about public health and Supervisor Hart, you have been at so many of those um, press conferences. I think you might be the person to answer this, but what can you tell us about the long-term public health issues? What does it look like for people who've survived COVID, you know, including their families? Well, the research is evolving very quickly. Um, we don't have a clear picture about the long-term consequences of having been um, infected with COVID-19. The initial, some of the initial um, very scary news was that there could potentially be very long-term consequences and that 
Um, they could be very severe, even for people who did not require hospitalization, that there could be lung damage and other permanent um, damage. The most recent information that I've seen is that perhaps that um, may be reversing itself with some people and that they're the, the most severe concerns and consequences may not materialize, which would be great news. But this is also new. You know, we really have no um, so solid medical long-term information because we're only eight months into the pandemic. And so, in fact, all of the things that we're talking about today, you know, we don't know what the long-term consequences of all of these things are. We're, we're managing in the moment in the crisis and looking ahead around the corner. But, you know, honestly, from the county's perspective, looking around the corner is the next two months. You know, how are we going to survive through the end of the year? Um, the partnerships we've developed with all the organizations that are here today are the answer for the long term. And that that's one of the things I think as a community we should be most proud about. Absolutely. So we will move on now to a section where we will ask the panelists to talk more about the long term and, you know, from their perspective, what the long term looks like, you know, are there systemic or policy changes that are needed to really move beyond recovery. And I will be starting with Rubai Estes from the Santa Barbara Foundation, who again, you know, has that that eye on all of the different nonprofits and funders in our community. So Rubai. Thank you. I'll start with systems and then move to policy. A quote that still rings so true to us today. The true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable groups by Mahatma Gandhi. And even though this is a global pandemic, our wellness is dependent on our local response. So some models estimate this could go on from five, possibly to 10 years, noting that we know, as Supervisor Hart mentioned, about the progressive loss of income to local municipalities. And please don't forget what Frank and Edder and Lisa are emphasizing that during these downturns, there's a disproportionate impact on individuals and families who are already marginalized. Not something that was created by the pandemic. This is a disparity that's been evident in our community over decades. So recovery and re rebuilding for us is gonna look a lot more like baselines and wraparound services rather than feeling what typically an emergency response you do is feeling that supply chain for disaster relief. What we mean by that is food, shelter, and safety, but also behavioral health, and most importantly, waste management, and a strong and complete referral mechanism. Government and nonprofits will continue to receive new clientele. These are individuals and families who've never navigated services before. This is their first time. And those serving them, those government and nonprofit agencies will need increased capacity for the long term, not just to the end of the pandemic, to serve these new community members um, as part of their We are a part of whole, so no one sector, and I think it's evident, and I'm preaching to the choir here, no one sector agency is going to do this alone. And as as again, Supervisor Hart said on this panel alone, you see key actors and coordinated efforts and wonderful work. And this is where we have the privilege as a funder to see the lining, the isolated seniors program, housing for the harvest, Latinx indigenous migrant COVID-19 task force, Nivios, act on homelessness, food action. I could go on and calculate it about 31 of them. So thank you for the work all of you are doing. In terms of policy and implementation, we consider access, and access is a key issue for everyone that needs service, as being socio-emotional, socio physical, and financial. To truly make services available to all communities, we have to address all these points of access. Having a food district site that is two miles from a migrant farm worker, let's say a senior center, it might as well be 50 miles away. This is not a place of familiarity. This is not a place of need. Um, this is, there may not be language or cultural access. Do I feel safe coming to you? Think about that. Reference in policymaking, reference women's well being index. I am an evaluator in my past life. I cannot emphasize this enough. How is the policy legislation going to impact women specifically? 
mortgage incentives, planning and urban development, USDA grants. How is this going to impact women and particularly women of color? One of the major breaks in the system is how we allocate public funds. Most federal and funding is done official poverty measures. Family resource centers know this best. When a family is working to break out of poverty, there's a massive cliff where all subsidies are pulled out. When we are considering incentives and policies, we have to look at supplemental poverty measures. These poverty measures actually calculate the expenses that an individual and family, family actually has rather than it being income-based. Consider nonprofits as essential workers. Um, these, I don't think this much can say, and nonprofit workers are essential workers, and that's been evident. And lastly, and I'll close there, universal childcare. Childcare is a basic need. There's no ifs and buts about it. It impacts every individual, every family. Look at it as an economic driver, and also through the lens of equity, but care is a basic need. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, bravo. Thank you. Uh, perfect, Rubai. That was a perfect setup uh, for me. So what, what we're seeing right now is some of what was referred to uh, just a minute ago. You know, that's the needs are increasing. Needs are intensifying. The, the hole is getting deeper. It would be a way uh, to say that. There, and there are a lot of newly eligible people because a lot of people have lost their employment during this time. We're also seeing that um, extra funding to meet extra needs is running low or running out. Some of that is, uh, you know, the relief funding at the federal level. Some of it is uh, private funding at our local level. The funders have been just tremendous in stepping up to meet the need. And it's been one of the uh, amazing um, shining lights, I think, in our uh, community. Uh, and everyone's resources are, are you know, mostly running, running low at this point. I would also say that the, the costs of providing assistance are higher. Um, and I hadn't expected this, honestly. It is a crisis, so I should have expected it. But what I mean by that is we're, we're for example, providing childcare for our staff so that they can assist community members. That's costing our agency $3,500 a week of unbudgeted cost that we have, along with everything else the PPE, the Zoom accounts, the everything else that it takes to uh, provide this. So the cost of operating is more um, and the needs are more and uh, more intense. Um, the partnerships I think um, have been tremendous during this time. Uh, and that's been, I think another saving grace for all of us is that we have been working together really wonderfully. So moving forward, it seems we do need more funding, we do need more resources, and we need flexibility with those resources so we can use them in the ways that communities need. Um, we also continuing to partner uh, is, is really important. Um, and then also the last thing I had put is we need appropriate and accessible assistance to all populations. That this discrepancy we have uh, across the, the country, probably the world in regard to equity is very, very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Frank. Yeah, um, th thanks to Rui and, and Lisa for that. Um, yeah, I agree, um, and and especially in in uplifting um, communities that are disproportionately being affected. Um, it's really how are we having productive, critical conversations about racism? Um, another issue that we know has has been uplifted during these times, and um, um, and especially in our region, and really appreciative of 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 coalitions and and movements such as Healing Justice here um, in our region and other groups throughout the Central Coast, um, um, especially Black community leaders who have been uplifting um, responses in local law enforcement, but as as an organization with with cause and with 805 and DocuFund, it's kind of the the, the racism that we see in terms of uplifting um, and trying to respond to to the supporting communities of color. So how do we um, engage in these cr difficult and critical conversations um, um, and especially as, as, a, as someone who grew up here in town and um, um, how do we kind of 
look at that inequality that we know is here, especially in, in Santa Barbara? How do we look at the inequalities between North County and, and South County in Santa Barbara that I know preach on the choir on that as well, but um, I think it's really how do we properly engage in discussing about um, addressing racism as part of this response to, to creating healthy communities. Um, and and um, looping it back to kind of what we've been focusing on in terms of tenant rights, it's um, um, or an economic kind of rights that folks have. We know there's a history of that has led to folks um, being segregated. There's a history of what's led to folks not um, being able to get those investments um, from banks in order to to get a home or get property over over the generations here in our region. So I think there's a lot that we have to delve into, and hopefully that critical conversation can be one that that is open um, um, and that is um, fruitful, um, because I think that's how do we get better um, after this? How do we make sure that we are having, um, um, and what I mean critical is really, really getting to the truth of, of how do we address these inequalities that we see in our region that are not easy to solve. However, um, if we have the right language to talk about the problems, um, I think we're going to be set up to, to address these better. So um, that's what I think we've been really looking at and um, cause being around for, for almost 20 years, working on really uplifting um, um, monolingual Spanish speakers and 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 um, immigrant communities. It's it's important to see um, not only having that language access, but creating those spaces for agency, um, so that individuals come into these these spaces. Let it be our legislative bodies or um, working with nonprofits with 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 agency and with power in order to to really push on on really finding those solutions that we need. So super excited to see that happen, um, and excited to have um, talked with y'all today about that. Thank you, and Edder. Hi everybody again. Um, I, I, you know, COVID nineteen has definitely shown and exacerbated inequities in our community. Um, and fortunately, locally, we have organizations that have stepped up and been able to meet the needs. Not all of them, but definitely meet some needs, especially for the undocumented community. But this can only go so far. We need systemic policy change at the state level and even the federal level to make sure that undocumented families and even low-income families have the resources they need to get through a disaster or, or a pandemic. Um, policies such as safety net for all, which would provide unemployment benefits to undocumented families are needed for our undocumented brothers and sisters. Um, at the federal level, we need a comprehensive, um, comprehensive pathway to citizenship for um, all undocumented families here in the United States. We have 11 million, close to 11 million undocumented residents in, in, this, in this country. And unfortunately, um, not everyone has an 805 undocumented fund in their backyard. Not everyone has uh, organizations willing to support. So we know that systemically we need to provide um, a pathway to citizenship. And we also need to rethink how um, the Department of Homeland Security targets undocumented immigrants. We know that ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement, uh, terrorizes our communities daily um, with, um, the family separations and also going into neighborhoods and communities, even our own community, um, because it's, it's definitely spreading a lot of fear. Just last week, um, I texted Frank because my, my aunt told me that um, ICE was um, at the bakery, at Rose Bakery, um, La Bella Rosa on the west side, and she didn't want to go get bread. She didn't want to leave her home. And that's something that's happening, not just here in Santa Barbara, but across the United States. So we need to make sure that you know we we abolish ICE and we look at ways in which we elevate undocumented immigrants um, because what they're going through is um, is, is scary um, on the education front. Um, we also need to make sure that uh, low income Latino students are provided what they need to make sure they succeed. Locally, less than twenty five percent of Latino youth complete uh, college readiness courses, known as the A through Gs. We need to make sure that's that means that almost 75% of Latino youth aren't even qualified to apply to a four year school. We need to make sure that locally we uh, create systems in place that to make sure that these students have the resources they need to make sure that they can complete the A through G's and be college bound because that's the only way that we're going to be able to create a college going culture. And that's the only way that we're going to lift up communities that have historically been underserved and marginalized. Um, and lastly, on funding, um, I can talk about this all day, but um, community, uh, 
organizations led by people of color have also been historically underfunded. Um, we need to make sure that we advocate for these organizations who have built long lasting, uh, trusting communities with, um, you know, undocumented communities here, Latino communities. We need to make sure that these organizations are lifted and that they're funded fully um, because they're at the they're at the forefront of making sure of these rep response efforts. Um, these dollars need to be unrestricted. They need to make sure that these organizations can build capacity so that in the long run, they're here, you know, for the, for the census effort, for the COVID efforts, we've definitely done a lot of work, um, but we need to make sure that people of color organizations are also uh, funded at the same level and that they have the resources needed. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. Um, uh, I think that the previous speakers have expressed something very well, um, uh, which is that the inequity in our system makes us weak. And looking at this through in uh, the lens of resilience um, and building resilience uh, to address the ever increasing challenge of climate change, um, if we can't address uh, a system that is uh, that that creates the kind of inequity that then creates a safety net where the same people fall through in every crisis. Um, uh, we can't succeed, um, and so uh, conversely, if we want to succeed, we need to address this inequity systemically. Whether we're talking about multi generational poverty or racism or a number of factors that are contributing to what we're seeing now, which is over 100,000 people on food aid in our county um, and uh, you know, homeless people <laughs> in every neighborhood um, uh, it, it is to, to see that it is in all of our collective interests, no matter where we are on the economic scale uh, in, in helping the people who are at the bottom of this scale get to a place of stability because until we can achieve that, we're in a we're in a form of survival mode as opposed to a form of resilience or resilience building mode and and i think that if this pandemic has done anything to expose just the the systematic nature of of the way inequity breaks down resilience in a community um it, it's we, we have it in front of us and so i'm hoping that we will actually start to learn this lesson and realize that um, we need to shift things in in very significant way uh, moving forward if we're hoping to be put ourselves in a position to successfully address the challenge of climate change. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, at CEC, we have been doing a lot of soul searching about these issues of, of equity that everyone has raised. And, and, and one of our core principles has always been um, social justice is climate justice. We're not gonna get one without the other. And we are in the process right now of finalizing a five-year strategic plan that is really focused on, on keeping that at the forefront of the work that we do. Um, in terms of policy, um, we've seen two things happen in Santa Barbara in the last several months that have been quite interesting. One of them was just yesterday, where the city council overturned the uh, decision by the Historic Lands Commission to allow a bike share, which, um, for which we are very grateful. Thank you, Council Member Harmon, who's here, and, and all the rest of the council who voted unanimously for this, because this is one of the pieces that we have been pushing for for a very long time to address climate change. People who commute here by train or bus, which is what we want um, to alleviate the traffic on our roads and keep us from having to keep trying to uh, in, in expand the 101, um, they need that last mile solution. They, people need a way to get to their workplace from the, the train station or the bus depot and a, and a bike share will accomplish that. So we are very happy to see that happen. Um, the closure of State Street to Cars is, is another example of this rapid response uh, of a policy that has been pushed for for a very long time by a lot of groups, um, including CEC. Um, so, you know, that, that has something that's come out of the pandemic that has been kind of interesting. 
in general, the transportation system is really one that is facing a huge amount of disruption because of the coming on board of electric vehicles, of shared mobility, and also of the potential for autonomous vehicles. And the pandemic has changed the way many of us now transport ourselves. A lot of us are, might continue to work from home even after things open back up. Um, and the way we get services, you know, I had a doctor's appointment yesterday by telehealth. So I didn't have to get in my car and go drive to a doctor for a 20 minute appointment. Um, and also goods, uh, a lot of online shopping, which clearly has its pluses and minuses, but this is part of the change that we are all experiencing um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, at the state level, Governor Newsom's recent executive order that all passenger vehicles and trucks be electric by 2035 is a huge policy signal that positions California at the forefront of this um, revolution in transportation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about plastic for a minute. That's a program that I manage, so I kind of know the most about it and also just have been incredibly disappointed at the surge of use of single-use plastic products during the pandemic. Um, restaurants, you know, use it for takeout, which we want to support the restaurants, and, and I did that as much as I could. Um, and, you know, bared the consequences of getting takeout uh, plastic containers, um, but they're still using them um, even for dine-in, which is kind of frustrating to see um, because this feeds into the goals of the fossil fuel industry. Um, the fossil fuel industry is using the pandemic as a wedge issue to increase their market share for plastic because they are losing that market share in other areas like transportation and buildings with, with uh, electric cars and renewable energy. So they have a stated goal to increase the fossil fuel amount that goes to plastic from 8% to 20% by 2025. Um, and this is an equity issue in and of itself because uh, the extraction and manufacturing um, of all fossil fuel products, but especially plastic, um, happens very near low income communities of color. So, um, and, and the, the, they really took advantage um, of this pandemic by spreading misinformation that disposables are safer, which um, public health professionals have come out in great numbers to say that disposables are not safer. Um, so, you know, that's really something we have to address long term. It's also exposed loopholes in current, you know, legislation that so many of us worked hard to get over the years um, because you can distribute plastic bags of a certain thickness. And so now the stores are distributing these bags that are very thick because they're categorized as reusable, but we're not seeing a lot of them being reused. So long-term policy, I think we really have to address the whole plastic issue more holistically um, to address it at the scope rather than tackling one item at a time. And I wanna close with a cartoon that some of you may have seen um, that has stuck with me where there's two people on a beach with a wave that's crashing around their knee level saying, and it's labeled COVID, saying, um, well, we're, we're, we're managing this, you know, we're getting through this. And what they don't see is the tsunami coming over their heads behind them that is labeled climate change. Um, so, so I think a lot of the lessons we're learning through the pandemic can um, translate to addressing climate change, but um, there's also a ticking clock on that. Thank you. Council Member Harmon. Thank you, Emily. Um, wow, I just, I really have to start by expressing my sincere gratitude to all of you that have spoken before me. I mean, you all are really out there doing the work in our community. So truly my sincere thanks. Um, yeah, you know, it's true what everyone has said, obviously that the COVID crisis really has deepened um, many of the inequalities that exist in our community. But I, I personally have really learned an important lesson um, legislatively. And, and that's that it's important that we don't think of this crisis and its impacts to historically marginalized, folk, marginalized folks in our community in a vacuum, right? Like a lot of these inequalities, all of them actually are a function of legislative efforts that we have taken over the years that have um, either intentionally or unintentionally concretized inequality in our community. So, uh, you know, when I talk about what COVID has exposed or what it has highlighted in our community, I think it's really important from a legislative perspective that we take responsibility for how our actions have actually um, 
set us on this course and that we try to rectify that from a policy position. So, or from a policy perspective, excuse me. So one of the things that I see for us um, legislatively as a city moving forward first and foremost is really to try to look at policy making through a more intersectional lens. And I think that's where we've gotten into a lot of trouble speaking totally frankly as a city. Um, when we've been so siloed in the um, particular subject matter area without thinking about the implications for different communities or in different areas of, of focus. And, and personally speaking, and I think it's true for my colleagues as well, um, that it's important to us that we think about policy in an intersectional way and think about the ways that um, our efforts will have broader implications um, for, for all of our neighbors. And I think it's never clearer than when we're talking about the housing crisis in the city of Santa Barbara. I mean, this has been a conversation we've all had for many, many years, but it's been notable to me the difference. When I first got on council, we talked about housing issue in a very sort of limited scope way and, and didn't really problematize it and bring into the conversation tenant rights issues or how development impacts um, our climate and, and how eviction is impacted by the housing crisis. And, and I think moving forward, um, glass half full, one of the benefits is that we've had some real learning about the necessity to have truly fulsome conversations if we're actually going to serve our community, if we're going to put forward policy that will in the long term um, lessen that inequality and lift up our community in the ways that we need it to. So, so housing um, is really going to be a major focus. It always has been and uh, never more so than now, um, Emily, I think you and, and many speakers brought up those that are experiencing homelessness. Certainly, um, as a community, we need to focus on how to serve our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness. Um, it, it is definitely something we're concerned about, strongly concerned about with the looming eviction crisis, um, how our neighbor, neighbors will navigate that and how we can best serve them given the housing challenges that we already have in the city. Um, and finally, economic diversification is um, a huge policy challenge for our city that uh, has implications for all of these other areas that I think we'll be focused on. And um, obviously the closure of State Street is a part of that, but that's gonna be a broader conversation that as a city, we're going to need to address moving forward. Thank you. And finally, Supervisor Hart. Well, I just wanna take this opportunity to again, thank the League of Women Voters to for assembling this incredible panel and for or having this very high level, thoughtful conversation about what COVID has done to challenge us and the responses that we are all taking. And I wanna really congratulate Council Member Harmon for her leadership with the city of Santa Barbara. It is really fun and exciting to be a partner with somebody who is so thoughtful and uh, really brings passion and, and a great sense of intellect and uh, creativity to her job as an elected leader. It's really, really a pleasure to work with her and everybody on this panel. Well, this is one of the things that makes me most so proud about our community is that there is this capacity, there's this expertise, this wealth of information and knowledge and passion to address these really difficult um, challenges. Something that immediately comes to mind as a result of our conversation is that wonderful quote from the former mayor of Chicago that we should never let a serious crisis go to waste. And that is exactly what we are doing. We are taking the lessons that we're learning in this moment and applying them directly to the urgent problems that we're facing from the crisis, but not stopping there, but thinking about how those systems can evolve and be better to handle the next crisis. And Abe's entire mission with the Bucket Brigade about having community volunteer action that's thoughtful and organized and effective is really the mantra that all of the organizations that are working in Santa Barbara County are applying to this to this lens and that quote about not letting this um, crisis go to waste what that actually means is let's do things we can't have done before that weren't possible before let's find new partnerships and new creativity and new collaboration that goes beyond what we have been doing 
to be more effective and more powerful in addressing the inequities that we all see in, in every one of our um, works and all of our work and, and thinking about the consequences you know, to, to the climate and to the global world that we live in. Um, you know, when you really think about it, Santa Barbara County is like a microcosm of the country. We are a blue state and a red state stapled together. We have some of the most vast income disparities that you will see in any place the, the poorest portions of the United States of America are represented in our county and the most wealthy. And our ability to work together to, to combine the resources from that wealth with the needs and the urgency to help our neighbors is a real opportunity and a challenge for all of us every day in our lives as leaders. And I look forward to working with all of you to do more work in that space every day going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of the panelists and all of the participants today. You know, the League of Women Voters, whether it is environmental issues or social policy issues, will certainly be looking at the, these issues as we move beyond recovery and ask you to join us and become more involved. And all of the panelists, you know, also please, please let us know what are the emerging, emerging policy actions that will help you know, move us forward and beyond recovery to an even more healthy and resilient community. So thank you all again for participating. And we will be, of course, sharing the video as soon as possible for people who weren't able to attend today. Thank you very much. Thank you all.